Now an extraordinary story from the Second World War, a humanitarian story that didn't come to light for decades. It concerns a young Londoner named Nicholas Winton who went to Prague and ended up saving the lives of 669 children, mostly Jews, from almost certain death. His story begins at the end of 1938 with Europe on the brink of war. In Germany, violence against Jews was escalating, and the infamous Munich Agreement paved the way for Hitler's armies to march unopposed into Czechoslovakia. In London, Nicholas Winton had been following events and knew that refugees fleeing the Nazis were in dire straits. He went to Czechoslovakia to see if there was anything he could do to help. What's strange is that for almost 50 years, he hardly told anyone about what he had accomplished. And for 50 years, the children knew nothing about who had saved them or how. We begin on October 1st, 1938. Nazi troops marched into the Sudetenland, the German-speaking region of Czechoslovakia. Prague, the Czech capital, was flooded with desperate people trying to escape. A fortunate few were able to send their children abroad. These parents, mostly Czech Jews, sensed war was coming and wanted to get their children out. By chance, a cameraman filmed a man holding a boy, a 29-year-old Londoner. His name, Nicholas Winton. All I knew was that the people that I met couldn't get out, and they were looking of ways of at least getting their children out. Nicholas Winton is one of the few people who can bear witness to those days because he's 104 years old. He told us he went to Prague to see if he might be able to save some people. But what made you think you could do it? I work on the motto that if something's not impossible, there must be a way of doing it. Back in London, Winton was a successful stockbroker living the good life with a passion for sports. But he was deeply concerned about news reports from Czechoslovakia of German persecution. I went out into the camps where the people who had been displaced were put. And it was winter, and it was cold. Immigration wasn't an option. The world's doors were closed to the refugees. Conditions in the camps were brutal for the 150,000 people trapped there, especially for the children. And no one focused on them until Nicholas Winton. But what did he do? We went to Jerusalem to Yad Vashem, Israel's memorial to the victims of the Holocaust, and asked Dr. David Silberklang, a senior historian there. And Winton went, set up shop in a hotel in the center of the old city in uh, Prague, and began looking into how can I organize getting some of these refugees, particularly the children, out of here. What kind of experience did he have to qualify him for this immense bureaucratic task? None. Winton set up a small organization with one aim, to get as many kids out as fast as possible. People started coming to him in increasing numbers. He didn't have time in the day to meet them all. He'd work till 2 in the morning, get up early in the morning to meet the next people. As more and more were coming, saying, take my child, take my child. By the time he returned to London, he had a list of hundreds of children and set out to convince British authorities to take him seriously. He did it by taking stationery from an established refugee organization, adding children's section, and making himself chairman. So that eventually they had to adopt me. So in fact, you managed to do what you did through a little deception, a little smoke and mirrors. Yes, to a certain extent, yes. It required quite a bit of ingenuity. No, it just acquired a printing press to get the, the notepaper printed. The children's section operated from a tiny office in central London. Winton's mother was in charge. The staff were all volunteers. During the day, Winton worked as a stockbroker. Evenings, he wrestled with the British bureaucracy. Did you approach any other countries to take some of the children? The Americans. But the Americans wouldn't take any. 
which was a pity we could have got a lot more out. Winton had written President Roosevelt asking the U.S. to take in more children. A minor official at the U.S. Embassy in London wrote back the U.S. was unable to help. Britain agreed to accept the children, but only if Winton found families willing to take them in. So he circulated the children's pictures to advertise them. But even after a family chose a child, British authorities were slow in issuing travel documents. So Winton started having them forged. He also spread some money around. Took a bit of blackmail on my part. You were indulging in blackmail and forgery? to get the children out. I've never heard it put like that before. <laughs> but you seem to be enjoying it. It worked, that's the main thing. The first 20 children left Prague on March 14, 1939. The next day, German troops occupied Prague and the rest of Czechoslovakia. Hitler rode through the streets triumphant. Hugo Meisel was 10 years old. Do you remember the Germans coming into Czechoslovakia? Not only do I remember, I personally saw Hitler standing up in the car and the children were expected to say Heil Hitler and so forth. I remember as if yesterday. It wasn't long before violence against Jews, property confiscations and forced labor that began in the Sudetenland spread throughout Czechoslovakia. But the Nazis allowed Winton's trains to leave in keeping with their policy to cleanse Europe of Jews. Hugo Meisel's parents decided it was time to put him and his brother on one of the trains. I remember that they told us that we were going to England, maybe two or three months, it would be a holiday for us, and that they would join us very shortly. And you believed them? Absolutely. Were your parents... Emotional when they said goodbye to you? No, I re- I, I, I've asked myself that question many times. How my parents had the strength It never occurred to me that what they were saying to us was not true. In other words, that they realized that they, they would not be joining us within a short period of time. Over the spring and summer of 1939, seven trains carried over 600 children through the heart of Nazi Germany to Holland, where they took a ferry to the English coast. From there, they caught a train to London. An eighth train, carrying 250 more, was scheduled to leave Prague on September 1st. But that's the day the war began. They were all at the station, even on the train waiting to go. And war was declared, so the train never left. Never heard really what happened to all those children. But there's reason to suspect that not many of them survived. I think that's true, yes. Two years after that last train, the Nazis began implementing the final solution, their plan to slaughter all the Jews of Europe. Czech Jews were rounded up and shipped to Theresienstadt, an old military garrison town about an hour north of Prague, their first stop on the road to annihilation. These tracks were the exit from Theresienstadt, the only exit. The tracks led east. The trains were called Polish transports. Destination, Auschwitz. Some 90,000 people took that one-way ride. Among them, almost all the children so Nicholas wasn't able to get out in time. Their parents and the parents of the children already in England. After the war, you went back to Czechoslovakia. Was there one instant where you accepted the fact that your parents were dead? Uh, For three years, we used to visit when trains came from Siberia, especially when the communists moved in in 1948, a lot of people started coming back from Siberia. So I would go to a station hoping, and when films were being shown of people walking in concentration camps, 
Auschwitz and so forth. There are so many shots being taken by the Germans and, and so forth. Um, never stopped looking. The name of every Czech Jew murdered in the Holocaust is painted on the walls of Prague's Pinka Synagogue, over 77,300 names, including Arnoshka and Pavel Meisel, Hugo's parents. And Nicholas Winton, during the war he volunteered for an ambulance unit for the Red Cross, then trained pilots for the Royal Air Force. He got married, raised a family, earned a comfortable living. For 50 years, he told hardly anyone what he had done. A question which I know intrigues everyone who hears your story is why did you keep it secret for so long? I didn't really keep it secret. I just didn't talk about it. All this time, you're in England, then you go back to Czechoslovakia, then you go to Israel, you still had no idea how your departure from Czechoslovakia had been organized. Absolutely no idea. And you learned that by seeing it on television. That's right. In 1988, the BBC learned about Winton's story and invited him to be part of a program. He had no idea that the people sitting around him were people he had saved. Can I ask, is there anyone in our audience tonight who owes their life to Nicholas Winton. If so, could you stand up, please? Mr. Winton, would you like to turn round? On behalf of all of them, thank you very much indeed. I suppose it was the most emotional moment of my life suddenly being confronted with all these children who weren't by any means children anymore. No, they weren't and for the first time they looked at you and knew that you were the reason that they were alive. Yeah. True. I wore this around my neck and this is the actual path that we were given to come to England. And I'm another of the children that you face. Lady Milliner Grenfell Baines describes Winton as one of the most modest people she's ever met. Why do you think he didn't say anything for 50 years? I think it was in his, in his nature. He really felt that he'd done all he could. And having got those children settled, he felt, been there, done that, my job's done, I've got other things to do other things. For the last 50 years, Winton's been helping mentally handicapped people and building homes for the elderly. We've just opened our second old people's home and it's full and it's doing very well and there are plenty of old people like me to go in. But you're not there, you're at home. Oh, I'd hate to go into one of my own homes. <laughs> Don't print that. <laughs> Sir Nicholas Winton. In 2003, Winton was knighted and became Sir Nicholas Winton. In the Czech Republic, he's become a national hero. He was celebrated in a documentary called Nicky's Family, but he isn't really comfortable with all the adulation. I'm not interested in the past. I think there's too much emphasis nowadays on the past and what has happened and nobody is concentrating on the present and the future. In 1939, Nicholas Winton used a two-week vacation to go to Prague and ended up saving the lives of 669 children. In the decades since, of course, the children had children who then had children and so on, and the numbers multiplied. You want to summarize it in one sentence? A guy takes a two-week vacation. And ends up with 15,000 children, yeah. 
Yes. It's a pretty good story. It's a great story. <laughs> They've got children and grandchildren and great grandchildren. And none of them would be here if it hadn't been for Sir Nick. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Terrible responsibility, isn't it? 